Arthropods are the most diverse group of animals on the planet. One of the most interesting groups of arthropods includes the arachnids. This is the lineage of arthropods that consists of groups that have four pairs of walking legs, groups like spiders and scorpions. In this video, I'll tell you a little bit about the work that we do here at the Sharma Research Group. And as a focus of our, uh, our investigation today, we'll take a look at what's shown in this picture, the eyes of spiders. As you will see, spiders have multiple sets of eyes, and these are divided into a couple of different types. We give these eyes different names because they are structurally and functionally different from one another. The median eyes have a particular property that, may be, that make them very useful for hunting in groups like hunting spiders, uh, as for example the one shown in this video. Lateral eyes, which can occur in different numbers and different configurations around the head, have very different properties, uh, and these are the ones that are responsible for eye shine, that, uh, that glow that you'll sometimes see at night when you shine a flashlight in the dark. That's a spider looking back at you. Now surprisingly, we don't know very much about how it is that spiders make their eyes. One interesting phenomenon that occurs in caves is that spiders, as well as other groups of animals, will lose their eyes. Shown here in these photographs are a couple of arachnid species, a spider in the top left and a whip spider in the bottom right. These animals are adapted to life in darkness and are missing their eyes completely. So one interesting question for us is not only how do spiders outside caves make their eyes, but how do spiders inside of caves lose them? To pursue these kinds of questions, we form international collaborations with various institutions. The main project that we're pursuing right now is in collaboration with my counterpart at the Hebrew University, Dr. Efrat Gavish Regev. She and her team have been responsible for finding and describing much of this diversity. As it turns out, many of these species in caves are brand new and unknown to science. We provide some of the expertise in some of these groups, for example, uh, the armored harvestmen, but much of our expertise lies in developmental genetics. That is, how do genes make some of the structures that are of interest to us? To pursue this project, we end up going into uh, many different cave sites uh, all across Israel, and a couple of the different team members are shown here, rappelling into caves, climbing into a very claustrophobic spaces, and as well as bringing a mobile lab to study arachnids in the field. Why Israel? Part of the reason has to do with the sheer number of cave sites that are uh, in each other's vicinity and are very uh, amenable to this kind of research. So in the past three years, we've surveyed something on the order of 45 cave sites. The animals that we're looking for are shown here. They look very different because they're completely different groups of arachnids. Spiders are shown at the top, whip spiders in the middle, and armored harvestmen at the bottom. As I told you before, a part of what we do involves biodiversity discovery. For example, the species in the bottom right, Hasus na'asane, this is a species that was described by us just last year. It occurs only in one cave site in Israel and nowhere else in the world that we know of. All the species that you see on the left side of this figure are the ones that occur in shallow or outside of cave environments, and they tend to have eyes. The ones on the right side are the ones that occur very, in very deep caves, and they're missing eyes altogether. Whip spiders, that lineage in the middle, is the one that I'll tell you a little bit about today. These animals are called whip spiders, but in reality, they are not spiders at all. They do not have any venom, and they do not spin silk. What makes them unique is this pair of whips, these very long uh, pair of walking legs that have been modified into antennae-like structures. These are used to sense the environment. One other interesting thing about whip spiders is that uh, the moms will actually brood the animal or brood the embryos underneath them, and then when the babies hatch, they'll crawl out and uh, hang onto the mom's back until they're old enough to go and fend for themselves. So here you're looking at a whip spider with her babies uh, hanging out on her back. So to understand these kinds of questions, our approach is to take embryos of these species, both from outside the cave, shown here in blue for Yoniticus, and the ones deep in the cave, shown for Israelensis in green. We compare gene expression in the two different species to ask what genes are being overly expressed in the cave-dwelling species versus the surface species. And this gives us some ideas about what genes might be involved in making the differences between these two morphs. 
Having understood which genes might be playing a role in patterning eyes, we need functional data sets to understand what those genes actually do. To provide this information, we investigate the function of these genes in, the, in a model species called Parasteatoda tepidariorum, the common house spider. This is the house spider you have probably have in your home in your windowsill. Our approach is to perform gene silencing or gene knockdowns where we turn off a gene of interest at a certain point during development. Here, I'll show you what happens when we turn off a gene called SOA. This is a gene that is, as shown in the schematic with these circles, is expressed in all of the different eye types of a spider. We inject the virgin females with a double-stranded RNA against SOA, which is responsible for turning off the gene. We then mate that female, and she lays cocoon after cocoon with animals that uh, misexpress or uh, rather uh, experience a loss of SOA expression. Every parasitic female will lay up to 400 embryos every 10 days or so. We take these cocoons and we affix them to glass slides. Here is a post-embryonic stage of a spider. This is a hatchling. And as you can see, it will eventually uh, molt out of that, uh, of that exoskeleton, and this is the first instar. The red spots that you're seeing on its head, those are the eyes. Shown here is a negative control. This is what a normal spider embryo, or rather, a normal spider hatchling looks like. Those black marks that you're seeing are the different sets of eyes. When we knock down SOA expression, we end up with a spectrum of phenotypes. We analyze thousands of uh, hatchlings, and we examine which eyes have been lost. This experiment shows you that animals in which we conduct a gene silencing of SOA will exhibit the loss of different sets of eyes, and in the most severely affected em uh, hatchlings, we will see no eyes whatsoever. The kinds of projects that we pursue then, as I've shown you today, touch upon biodiversity discovery, that is, discovering new species in various cave sites, uh, biogeography and population genomics, that is, how are different populations distributed across these cave sites, and is there gene flow between them, and a little bit what I touched on today, developmental biology, that is, how eyes are patterned, and the functional genetics, uh, how we conduct experiments to assess and interrogate the functions of different genes. For more information, please visit our website at www.charmerlabuw.org. Thank you for listening.